Welcome to our 42nd web debate. This time we meet to ask how COVID-19 is changing diplomatic practice. At Diplo, we organize these debates on the first Tuesday of each month in the context of the International Forum on Diplomatic Training. We focus on new and emerging topics. My name is Katharina Höhne. I'm the Director of Research at Diplo, and I have the pleasure to moderate these debates. So today we ask, how is COVID-19 changing diplomatic practice? Since March 2020, the image of diplomats and heads of states and government at virtual meetings has become very prominent in our perception. We get the impression that online video conferences have replaced traditional conference rooms. And beyond the novelty of these images, we need to wonder how social distancing and lockdown has, uh, in response to COVID-19, has changed the way dipl diplomacy is practiced. In order to start answering some of these questions, we have an excellent lineup of speakers. I'm very happy to introduce them, starting with Dr. Christine Egeling. She's a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Political Science at the University of Copenhagen. Then we have Mr. Sean Reardon, who is the director of the chair for diplomacy and cyberspace at the European Institute for International Studies and a senior fellow of the Chaha Institute in Beijing. We also have Dr. Jeffrey Robertson, who is an associate professor at Yonsei University in Korea and a visiting fellow at the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy at the Australian National University. Last, but certainly not least, we have Ms. Dalia Salinas Perez, a Mexican diplomat. Uh, she is currently posted to the Embassy of Mexico in Norway where she serves as the head of the consular section and leads a special project on innovation in diplomacy. And uh, just to note that she will be speaking in a personal capacity today. So we try to make this, inter uh, this debate as interactive as possible, which brings me to you, our audience. So let me also remind you that we are looking forward to your questions and uh, your comments. You can post them either here in Zoom or in the comment sections on Facebook and YouTube. My colleagues Natasha Perucicca and Katerina Angelkovic will be monitoring the comments and questions that are coming in and will bring them back into the discussion here. Speaking of interaction, we wanted to kind of kick off this debate with a quick poll that we're conducting with uh, you, our audience. So if you're in Zoom, you will be able to see this um, shortly. So we have one question for you just to get a bit of a feeling of um, the room. And the question basically is, what is the biggest challenge or what was the biggest challenge of the, over the past few months in terms of diplomatic practice? You have five possible answers and you have to pick uh, one of them. The five possible responses are first, one of the biggest challenge was maintaining contacts with diplomats from other missions. Second option is uh, ensuring the continuation of everyday tasks. Third option, advancing ongoing negotiations. Fourth option, addressing emerging challenges in light of COVID-19. And the fifth option in terms of uh, the biggest challenge in terms of diplomatic practice is not being able to engage with other diplomats informally, such as, for example, corridor diplomacy. So sharing results now, and I hope you can see them. It's a, a very interesting result. So almost 50% of you argued that the biggest challenge over the past few months in terms of diplomatic practice has been not being able to engage with other diplomats informally. And then the second, uh, the second biggest challenge is basically the uh, ensuring the continuation of everyday tasks. And that's a very interesting result, and it's also in line with some of the findings we already have as part of a, uh, a research we're doing on the conduct of diplomatic practice and how it changed due to COVID-19. So that question that I, asked, that I just asked you was part of a survey that we did with diplomatic practitioners. And there the result was very similar. One of the biggest challenge that um, they faced was the problem of uh, not being able to engage in informal uh, meetings. Another thing that we asked in the survey is um, this prominence of video conferencing and what the biggest challenge was in terms of 
um, video conferencing. And there we also had a very clear result uh, from diplomats. The biggest challenge in terms of video conferencing was related to security issues, followed by questions around the adaptation of communication and negotiation dynamics when we go online, when we engage in video conferencing. So with these things in mind, I would like to turn to our experts for today. And here especially, I would like to start um, with Dahlia, who could share some of her experiences uh, as a practitioner. So basically, uh, we know that COVID-19 has shifted the ways in which diplomats work. Some would even say that the changes have been um, fundamental and have longer term consequences. Um, Dahlia, from your experience, can you, can you share some observations over how you experienced the last couple of months? Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Yeah, sure. Um, well, thank you for having me today. Um, well, very, very briefly, I just want to, uh, to go a little bit back uh, before this COVID-19 uh, crisis came. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, diplomatic practice was already facing a challenge to adapt to the digital environment. Um, in the case of Mexico, for instance, Mexico conducted the most comprehensive reform of its foreign service law in 2018 as a response to what in Mexico was anticipating as an imminent uh, moment of change in the international environment and that we will all need to adapt in a very agile way. But uh, in the making of this reform, we could detect that many other countries were conducting exercises uh, to explore and reflect on the diplomatic practice and how it had to, up, uh, to be updated to the new realities. Um, but of course, by the time COVID arrived, I think nobody was prepared by, by the, for, for the high level of disruption that we would observe. And part of the thing here, I think, is of course related to technology, but that is not necessarily the most important disruption. I would think that just as what we saw in your poll, uh, many diplomats are resenting social distancing. And this is because the diplomatic profession relies heavily on trust and being trustworthy and building uh, relations uh, in which you can exchange sensitive information with your colleagues in order to advance a negotiation. And the problem is that until now, even though a lot of improvements have been made in platforms to accommodate the necessities of big conferences. Uh, there's still a lot of barriers that I personally don't know if they are uh, able to be substituted uh, or solved with technology. Um, many of my colleagues have referred uh, difficulty to have a good exchange, a personal exchange with uh, diplomats. Um, in the multilateral arena, for instance, due to security concerns, partly because they don't know if the, if the platform is safe enough for that. Probably sometimes it's about not sharing the same technology because the adaption, uh, we are not adapting at the same pace. But most importantly, because it's not the same to be in the same room under the same circumstances in a private conversation of being over screen and we don't know what is going on behind that screen, you know? So as one of my colleagues in New York told me, you can continue a relationship over uh, Skype or over a video call, but it's very different to build a relationship from there. And for diplomats, this has been one of the most important difficulties they have faced. Um, Building trust is it's very important, but also I think we all came to realize something that was being taken for granted for long, which is the value of a personal encounter. This is what I have shared with you a little bit of what is happening in the multilateral arena, but in the bilateral uh, diplomacy, for instance, um, some colleagues have referred to me the importance, how difficult it is now to convey the real priority or the real importance that your country pays to a bilateral relationship. Because back in the day, you would travel, you would go there, you would make, a, 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 you would pay them a visit and that would bring in itself a, a message of how important this relationship was for you. But now that everything has to be done virtually, then it's difficult to differentiate the value to convey that message. 
So that's also um, a very disruptive effect that we are seeing. Another very dis disruptive effect for diplomacy is the apparent um, um, the, how, how people tend to think that it's easier now to communicate directly with the capital, you know, among capitals. Because you don't need the diplomat because you can call directly to capital and get a response. But actually, it's not necessarily true. And many colleagues have referred uh, how difficult it is nowadays to having to go back to your capital to translate and explain the information that they receive directly from uh, their counterparts elsewhere. And in particular, in the case of COVID, as you know, being a health uh, problem, a health uh, related issue, many of the national authorities that now are competent uh, in, in these efforts are not necessarily uh, engaged routinely in the international uh, conversation. So many countries are having problems to translate international protocols or many other kinds of information and subtleties to their own capitals because they have been breached, not necessarily uh, with, um, with the intention of making them aside, but because these technologies make you feel that everybody is closer than they are really. So this is not only a matter of uh, geographical distance or uh, a matter of time, that now that we can work all around the clock, it is also about what, diplo di what diplomats do when they try to translate a culture, when they try to translate the, what we call in, in our jargon, the subtitles of a message to your capital. That's also something that uh, has been taken for granted in a bit. Um, I would want to, I, I don't want to take a lot of time for this introductory uh, message, but I won't, uh, I don't want to leave without making a distinction between what diplomacy or the typical diplomacy does and consular diplomacy is doing. Because actually, what we are observing in consular affairs, at least in our case, in the case of Mexico, is actually quite different. If multilateral affairs uh, or multilateral diplomacy is feeling a little bit um, uncomfortable, and the same goes for bilateral uh, diplomacy, in consular diplomacy, we experienced this in a way that was very liberating and empowering. And our capacity to connect with our community uh, nationwide has improved. And this is something that from the community perspective uh, has generated a very good impression for the governments. And I think every government has had faced this incredible challenge of helping your nationals to go back home in the middle of the crisis, these repatriation uh, efforts that were monumental. Um, but moreover, for those, for your diasporas, being at an embassy that is now connected to everybody, not just to those that, that live uh, near your office, this has been a very, a terrific uh, improvement for relations. So yeah, it's, it's been uh, very uneven. Thanks. I, th I think this is a really important reminder what you just talked about in terms of consular diplomacy, because it's, it's very easy to forget that aspect. And since you're the head of consular section, that's the ideal moment to, to bring that experience in. But also for the reminder you issued at the very beginning of uh, what you said, that this is a larger process in terms of digital diplomacy. And that's actually something we will get back uh, in the debate uh, quite, quite prominently, questions of digital diplomacy and digital, digitalization. Uh, I want to turn to uh, Christine for a bit uh, more observations in terms of um, practice. Um, I know that you worked uh, with diplomats in Brussels for a research project on digital diplomacy, which actually started way before uh, March this year. Um, but then when COVID-19 hit and the lockdown and social distancing, I think your project changed uh, quite dramatically. And then this uh, shift, uh, there was a shift towards what's actually happening now. Um, in terms of lockdown and social distancing. So from your observations, um, what do you think? To what extent can diplomacy function in times of lockdown and social distancing? What did you observe in Brussels? Yeah, thank you very much, Katarina, and thank you uh, for having me as part of your debate today. 
maybe a little bit opposite to the effect of having a real debate. I think I find myself and find that our research findings agree with kind of both the little poll we just did and with a lot of things that Dalia just said, that really one of the things that gets disrupted the most is these kind of everyday little practices diplomats and practitioners do to kind of keep everything going. And um, this has actually been said very nicely by one of our uh, practitioners by one of our research participants from Brussels who have who has called kind of the COVID crisis a perfect storm to diplomacy. So on the one hand, it's kind of disrupting uh, the substantial issues that diplomats have to deal with finding international agreements on pressing crisis, but it has also really disrupt disrupted uh, the number one kind of normal way of dealing with crisis and kind of of doing diplomacy, which is at the end of the day, all about the personal meeting, the face-to-face -face meeting, kind of bringing people, representatives of the state and thus polities together to kind of mediate estrangement or overcome some sort of uh, social or political distances. Um, and so what we've seen kind of over the last couple of months, really working with practitioners in the in the first kind of shock moments of the pandemic, maybe March to June, is that they're really trying to invent a sort of a range of coping mechanisms almost to save the diplomatic meeting, right? To still save this idea of having this confidential, sacred, safe diplomatic space in which they can talk. Um, and what we can find there in, in relation to these coping mechanisms is that they're really trying to uh, invent a new way of working to uphold certain professional intimacies, routines, duties that are linked to the diplomatic profession as a whole. And in our research, we kind of call this the establishment of a new normal. And we see this both in virtual meetings, for example, so similar to this meeting we're having right now, um, they're trying also to simulate the atmosphere of, the, of a diplomatic meeting. And for example, there will still be flags in the backgrounds, just like academics have bookshelves in the backgrounds. There will be logos, there will be interpreters that are somehow part of the virtual meeting. So they're trying to keep the aura of diplomacy. But the second uh, really we found is that they're also trying to keep the frame and in our case, that meant that virtual meetings take place at the same time as analog meetings used to. They proceed according to the same rules, agendas, and procedures. So everybody gets speaking time. So a lot of the, let's say, analog practices, they try to translate them into virtual settings. But then also what we've seen is that they're really trying to save the physical meeting itself. So in the EU, there were two face-to-face -face summits. Uh, between the heads of the states. One was actually recently rescheduled at very short notice, something that's extremely uncommon kind of in the very tacted Brussels environment. Um, and they're also, when they have these face-to-face -face meetings, are trying to kind of perform and publicly display the togetherness uh, of the European Union as a whole and of kind of their little community um, of practice. So for example, earlier in May, we saw a lot of tweets where ambassadors were kind of like standing and meet uh, social distancing safe lines together, curated by comments, oh, we're still here, we're still working for the EU. So the diplomats are also trying to kind of almost um, underline this, the show must go on mentality in this moment of crisis to signal that they're still doing their work. Uh, so basically what we see in the EU in the first couple of months of the pandemic is that there's different ways of trying to save the diplomatic meeting as kind of this core idea and practice of, of diplomacy and both in relation to the rules, but also the atmosphere of the meeting. Thank you. I, I really like this phrase, um, the perfect storm for for diplomacy, but also this point about um, trying to uphold the, fr uh, the frame and trying to uphold the, the kind of atmosphere of the meeting. This actually brings me to, to a point of kind of digging a bit deeper into uh, aspects of digital diplomacy. And this brings me um, to Sean, who has been following developments in digital diplomacy for quite some time now. And here I want to ask in particular about the adaptation of uh, foreign ministries to digital technologies. And as Daria, as Daria also mentioned, uh, COVID-19 kind of accelerated a process that is already um, in, in motion, but now adaptation kind of has become a very crucial necessity. 
And from that perspective, what are the biggest obstacles um, faced in the process from your observations and from your, your experience, Sean? Um, yeah, I think although we've had lots of talk about digital diplomacy in recent years, actually diplomats have been pretty awful at doing it. And they've been very slow, they've been very reluctant. They've had this mythology about the face-to-face -face meetings and the importance of face-to-face -face summit meetings. And I think that, and I'm going to pick up something I've seen that Jovan is saying in the chat, it reflects a lack of historical memory. Uh, we have had very successful negotiations in the past where the whole point was to make sure that the principals never met each other. Because if they did, we'd have a fist fight on our hands. So I mean, Dayton is a notable one, Vietnam is another one that Jovan's mentioned. I think also we've got to remember the idea of leaders flying around the world to meet each other on a very routine basis is very new. Uh, it's also a very EU thing. It happens a lot more in the European Union than it does anywhere else. When I first became a diplomat in the midst of history, uh, we had very few summits. We had very few uh, meetings of government ministers or prime ministers. We relied very much on embassies abroad to do the face-to-face -face business. Now, I think what's happened here is that with the end of air travel, with restrictions being imposed, suddenly diplomats have been forced online. They've been given no choice. And actually, they've been discovering some advantages. There are some significant advantages in not having to bring everyone together in the same place at the same time. There are significant advantages in terms of flexibility. You can set up meetings much quicker. Uh, okay, so you, you lose the face-to-face -face contact, but then you have to start developing other ways of doing it. I don't think we're going to go back to the old way of doing things. We are going to be in a world where embassies can go in and see the foreign ministries, they can go into the other government ministries much easier, but we're not going to go back to a world of people flying around the world all the time to, uh, to meet each other for many reasons. One is it too ex it's going to be too expensive, air travel is going to be much more expensive. Another reason is that we're going to have all kinds of new health protocols about traveling, COVID tests and the like. And third thing is that foreign ministers have found you can do this online. It's half the price and much more flexible. And like every other government department, the pressure to cut costs in foreign ministries is going to be brutal. So I think we are going to see a new diplomacy in which the key role of the diplomat abroad is going to return. I mean, I've said in various tweets, we're going back to pre-civil aviation diplomacy, the way it used to be before we had cheap civil aviation. Um, and no, not necessarily a bad thing. I remember working the diplomat, we always used to say one ministerial visit always costs five weeks of good diplomacy to repair the damage. And um, often the case. I think what the, the really interesting challenge for me is now that we've broken this taboo, we've got diplomats, we've got government leaders online rather than face-to-face -face meetings, are we going to be able to use that to drive some real innovation in diplomacy? Because to be honest, having Zoom meetings and online meetings is not innov innovative. Video conferencing has been around for decades. Doing it online digitally is not new. So are we going to start moving towards some really innovative stuff, innovative use of platforms, use of uh, computer game modeling, and so on. And I think that's going to be, that's, to throw that as a question for our audience as well. Will this drive diplomats into becoming genuinely digitally innovative? And I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sean. Also uh, for this challenge, basically, when you said um, diplomats are awful at doing digital diplomacy, that that's 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 a that's a big challenge out there. And I would love to hear more more comments on that. But also this uh, question of um, the historical perspective. And just keeping an eye on the chat, there's um, lots of agreement on 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 the points you made, um, Sean, about these more broader shifts that we will be seeing over the next couple of months and years. And that actually brings me um, to Jeffrey. Um, who in a recent, in a recent article, um, Jeffrey, you suggested that the more time spent in digital diplomacy environment, the less likely foreign ministries will return to previous practices. So here again, the idea that we will see a, a more fundamental shift in the next couple of months and years to come. So with this in mind, can you tell us a bit more of um, why you think this is the case, this uh, more fundamental shift and this uh, not returning to previous practices? Sure, uh, thanks for having me. Um, first, I have to say, I have the most difficult situation here, speaking after Dahlia, Kristen and Sean, it's almost impossible to add anything more. Three experts. 
but I'll try. Um, so if we look at it from an organizational level and think about what you actually need for innovation, for innovation, you need three things. You need a recognized need to innovate, you need skills and adaptability, and you need financing. COVID-19 has given that extra little push to allow these three things to come forward. You know, the impact of COVID-19, its immediate impact was immense. You know, negotiation, reporting, representation, they all came to a halt. The very fundamental you know, aspects of diplomacy stopped. So this impact upon processes and upon individuals meant that it was an immediate need, a recognized need for innovation, skills and ad adaptability. You know, as uh, Dahlia mentioned, um, we were just on the verge of uh, technology playing a larger role in everyday diplomacy. There were people in place, but adaptation was very slow. But now there are new job specializations and roles as training being implemented, new people are being hired, uh, best practice skills are being shared. The adaptability and the skills to support innovation have been prioritized. And lastly, finance. Well, finance was always difficult to find for anything in diplomacy, let alone digital diplomacy. But states are now starting to put money towards digital diplomacy because they recognize that there is a need. And capital expenditure is underway to ensure that um, the processes that are in place at the moment have a little bit more viability and a little bit more security in areas such as um, con video conferencing. Um, so the South Korean government just recently announced they're seeking five million extra dollars to develop their own platform for video conferencing. And lots of middle power states are doing similar things. So if you think about this in the context of an organizational level and in an organization which is traditionally conservative and very traditional focused, once innovation is in place, there's going to be a tendency to leave that in place until next time there is a recognized need. But on top of this, uh, the bean counters in the finance ministry they're going to see digital diplomacy as an ideal way to cut back expenditure. All countries are going to go through um, severe budget constraints over the next five years. And as practicing diplomats and ex-diplomats all know, foreign ministries are often the targets for general government budget cuts. The, fin the finance ministry is going to go through every line of expenditure to cut in the foreign ministry and the continued replacement of previous practices with digital diplomacy will feature prominently in their outlook for savings. I mean, everyone does recognize that digital diplomacy is currently not as good as an, and not as effective as it could be, and not as, as effective as in-person diplomacy. But if one thing is true, it's that diplomacy is very adaptable. And it's already adapting slowly to a digitalized operating environment. And for budget reasons, this could well continue into the future. So I see digital diplomacy as being pushed not only by foreign ministry themselves, but also by out, from outside the foreign ministry. And that's going to give it the momentum to see some real innovation. Thank you. I think, again, a very important reminder about a new normalcy. But also this, uh, this point about how digital diplomacy might be a way of addressing budgetary cuts, uh, resource challenges. But that's something we might actually, as you said, Jeffrey, we might see over the next couple of months and years. But again, this, uh, this point um, made earlier that uh, video conferencing and digital diplomacy in that sense is, is definitely um, not something new. And this brings me um, to my colleague Arvin Kamberi, uh, who is... Uh, engaged on, on, on the side of organizing these uh, kind of events. He has worked with hundreds of diplomats for uh, organizing online events, events requiring remote participation, such as the Internet Governance Forum and um, hybrid events. So um, Arvin, to you on, on, a, on a practical level, what are the biggest challenges or concerns uh, in your opinion that you observed uh, working with diplomats on these online events, on these kind of hybrid conferences or digital conferences. Thank you, Katarina, and uh, hi to all. Really pleasure to be with uh, such a great company uh, in the same Zoom room. And just to reiterate what Sean said uh, a couple of minutes ago, this is really not a new technique. 
online participation was here in international organizations and in other fora for uh, for decades now and as you mentioned cat we uh, we at diplo are doing this for more than a decade now um, organizing this kind of event which requires digital technology to actually connect to the room but connecting to the room is not the um, not the let's say the job is done Apart from that, uh, throughout these years uh, and through our courses, we actually kind of surveyed uh, um, this specific uh, group of people, diplomats, on what would be the most, um, let's say, most important stuff about or most important things uh, when they plan or actually uh, want to introduce an online conference or video conference or something like that. And uh, in, in that sense, um, uh, to uh, emphasize actually what was the major shift now uh, during the, the COVID? Well, uh, we almost unanimously got the answer that um, solving the security issues and security issues of data, data transported uh, through the, uh, this online platforms is now high on agenda of, for every organization. Uh, only a couple of years ago, the, let's say, um, structure of data and how, uh, how data is uh, transported over the internet uh, was the same, but was not questioned so much about uh, from uh, others. But now, uh, when diplomats go into the uh, online meeting rooms to negotiate, to do, um, to do business, which is not a, a public diplomacy, let's say, or want to use uh, uh, online rooms for a, a let's say smaller meetings or uh, controlled meetings, there are now major concern, uh, security concerns about the data which is transported in this, uh, in this way. Where it is stored, uh, sovereignty of data is now, of course, a big, uh, a big issue. And I think that the diplomats or all together community should maybe work on this, uh, on this particular issue creating some kind of maybe of a UN digital home or something like that, a place where diplomats will not take care of, uh, of uh, will not think about the security of data transported through these services, online services. Uh, another, of course, really important shift was also in a changing in, a, in dynamics of communication for online meetings, but again, uh, this is not a new technique and uh, online uh, online meetings and uh, there are improvements of course now with the massive use of online tools uh, diplomacy will get better and better of course on that uh, but this negotiation dynamics or dynamics of uh, overall uh, communication is something that is slightly changed uh, during the COVID. Thanks Katarina. Thank you, Arvin, for this kind of snapshot of what we've recently been seeing over the last um, couple of months in terms of priorities. And perhaps this uh, emphasis on security questions is not, is not surprising, but also the, then the question becomes, how, how do we solve this issue? How do, how do we address these concerns also in terms of trust or the lack of trust that, is, uh, that comes with uh, questions of security also? But speaking of kind of taking a snapshot, let us have a look at what's been happening in the chat and the kind of comments and questions um, we received um, there, which brings me to my colleague Natasha Perucicca to kind of summarize what's been happening so far and the kind of comments and questions we got. And with one eye, I saw that uh, it's, getting, it's getting a little controversial there, which is great. Over to you, Natasha. Hi, Kat. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I would just like to say before I get to the questions that I really enjoyed the part on consular diplomacy because this is something that we did not discuss very often, so it was really great to have a glimpse of that in the discussion. But I will dive right in now with the question that we received from our audience. Uh, so first, we started off with a question from Fabrice, who noted that the digital environment does not provide a replica of the physical world and therefore not the same benefits that we might associate with the physical world. Nevertheless, it is here to stay. And he therefore asked what opportunities do things, uh, to do things differently does the digital environment offer in the context of uh, diplomacy. We also had a comment uh, from Jovan that were already mentioned by uh, Sean earlier on, who raised the point on cleaning emotional noise associated with face-to-face -face meetings, which um, has been 
absent from some negotiations uh, in the past, including Dayton and Vietnam. Then we had a remark from Liz Galvez, who acknowledged that most diplomats on the ground are adaptable enough to cope with new channels of uh, communication. However, they have been faced with increasing responsibility in the context of COVID-19, including consular repatriation that has been already mentioned uh, by Dahlia earlier on, as well as sourcing of medical supplies. Uh, we also had a comment from Gary Diaz, who agreed with Jovan and Sean on the revalue of traditional um, on-site diplomats as a result of this new normal. And he raised the question on the challenge of uh, striking a balance between traditional diplomacy and digital diplomacy, asking um, what is the future for both of these fields? Will they be competing or complementing each other? And uh, the last question that we received was from uh, Rodrigo, who um, acknowledged that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs will be uh, reducing their budget uh, as a result of the economic um, economic challenges that the COVID-19 crisis has brought about. And um, he um, said that this might bring back the idea of the digital embassy that developed with the arrival of the internet. Um, he asked, uh, how do you imagine this uh, digital embassies to develop? Thank that you, Natasha. Be <laughs> Thank you. A, a, lot, a lot to debate. And um, basically, I would like to hand over to our speakers to kind of pick and choose the, the things they want to address here, but maybe also to address um, some of the things we heard um, uh, from, from all the speakers. Um, I guess for, uh, to make it easier, let's go in the same order as we did before, which means um, starting um, with Dahlia, your reflections on what we just heard. Thank you. Well, it's indeed a very interesting session. Thank you. I, I really appreciate being here. And all the comments, especially Sean's comments on the advantages that the digitalization of diplomacy offers, it's, it's super important. Absolutely. I totally agree with him. Um, Jeffrey reminded us what do you need for, uh, for innovate, for innovation. And of course, uh, financial support is part of it. And the problem that diplomacies face back home tend to be that we are very difficult to measure. When the finance minister wants to allocate resources, how do you measure the effectiveness or more importantly, the public value of a certain branch in the government? And the difficulty to measure all the benefits that a good effective diplomacy reports for its country tends to create the sense that it's easier uh, to cut there. But I would say that one of the most important uh, advantages of the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis has brought to diplomacy is precisely what Jeffrey mentioned. Now in our organizations, it's easier to see why there is a need to innovate. And I want to refer to a conversation I had uh, with a colleague around um, uh, we attended a conference here in Norway to better understand uh, in the Oslo Innovation Week how to, to better understand how companies are coping with digitalization. And there was an interesting case of study. They said that the Norwegian courts administration had a plan to digitalize the judicial system in Norway. And the plan was for the next 10 years. But with the COVID-19 crisis, they were forced to implement a lot of uh, these measures. And within two months, they finished with the plans. So in two months, they had a 10 year worth digital transformation. That means that if you haven't had a plan by then, you are 10 years behind. These are this kind of, um, of, of cases, these experiences can be very much eye-opening for foreign ministries and governments in general to assess where it is important to keep some financing because I think it's critical to invest in the future of diplomacy. Thank you so much. I think again, a very important uh, reminder. Uh, Christine, any reflections on uh, what we heard so far? Yeah, thank you. Um, Mary, maybe I'll just quickly kind of pick on, on two things that were said now. One kind of extending a little bit uh, what one of the comments said and one uh, putting putting out a potentially uh, provocative uh, 
uh, argument about the nature of the change and the history of diplomacy. So the first one, I think what we really need to say is that we can't divorce kind of the substance and the practice of diplomacy, right? And there was one of these comments here um, from a member of the audience saying, yeah, but diplomats are very good in adapting, they're kind of skilled improvisers. Uh, but the problem is that they're all of a sudden faced with all of these additional responsibilities and tasks. And this is something we've definitely also seen in Brussels. And I think this is maybe also a bit the difference between a bilateral diplomatic environment and a multilateral environment, because at least lots of the diplomats we've been working with normally kind of purely assigned to the Brussels environment were now telling us, oh, but we are working a lot with the capital back home, with the foreign ministry of the member state to work on repatriation and these kind of issues they don't normally uh, engage with. So I think that is that is definitely true. Um, the other thing I want to say, though, which kind of links a bit to uh, what a lot of you and the members of the audience have also said about, well, this isn't really new, this has been done before, and where is this going in the future? And uh, because we've been working on this question, how is digitalization changing diplomatic practice, actually, as Katarina said in the beginning, for almost two years before COVID started. And there, I just remember one kind of very uh, eye-opening uh, conversation I had with a diplomat uh, in Brussels who told me, yeah, you know, but there isn't really e-diplomacy and diplomacy. There's just diplomacy. And I think this is what we will we will see is that maybe this artificial separation between digital diplomacy and analog diplomacy is misleading and wrong. And that what we're actually seeing is a sort of blended diplomatic practice that like many other fields like mine, academia is now partly online and partly in real life. And we will always kind of shift the balance a little bit in one or the other direction, depending on depending on uh, what fits the situation better. Yeah, I, th I think that's a very important reminder on on the kind of distinctions that we make and how viable um, they are and how, how useful it is or not useful to think in terms of um, these um, dichotomies. Um, Sean, what aspects from the debate so far would you like to pick up on? Well, very quickly, Katharina, as you know, I hate talking about new diplomacies and complain continually about talking about new diplomacies. So I agree entirely with Christine that let's just focus on diplomacy and how we do it and how we do it effectively. And I would like to suggest that actually we want to digitalize foreign ministries, not embassies. The last thing we need are online embassies because embassies are where we do the personal contact. We meet senior foreign officials. We assess their intentions. All the more important in the cyber world where we're doing cyber security, cyber operations to do not give away their secrets in the way that physical operations do. Military attacks tell you a lot about what's intended. In cyber, that's not true. We need to be able to assess the intentions of foreign governments. If we're going to avoid attribution problems, we're going to avoid escalation problems. Actually, the old fashioned diplomat sitting, talking at great length and repeatedly to senior officials is more important now than perhaps five or six years ago particularly as we're going into a very dangerous geopolitical environment. Where I'd like to see the digitalization is in foreign ministries. Foreign ministries are still incredibly old fashioned. They still make policy proposals, often on paper, if not by email, and they look exactly like the ones I made 30 odd years ago. Problem, recommendation, background argument. When are we going to start getting to the stage where we start using computer gaming to explore policy spaces? I think there is where we're going to start seeing digitalization. Where are we going to start using digitalization to get rid of hierarchical structures, integrate embassies into foreign policy making? I wrote about this 20 years ago and it's still not happened. I think that's where we want the really radical digitalization to support the face to face diplomacy in the field. So uh, that's foreign ministries, not the embassies. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's exactly the point I would also pick up on from what you just said the uh, point about. Uh, digitalization at the foreign ministry, not necessarily um, the embassies. I think that's a very important point and a very succinct way of, of putting it. Um, Jeffrey, are there any aspects from the debate that uh, you would like to highlight or respond to or disagree with? Um, well, I, I think what's coming out uh, several times now is that there's going to be a blend between uh, the online and the in-person. But 
you've got to think about this in the long term. We are on a track and it's an irreversible track down the road towards more and more use of digital, uh, the digital environment. And there's no way to turn this back. And, you know, at the moment, we're focusing just purely upon the uh, communication levels of digital diplomacy. But there's, there's a much deeper level of digital diplomacy, which is yet to come out. Deep learning, machine thinking, artificial intelligence, robotics, all of these are going to come out in the next, let's say, 10, 20 years. And diplomacy, as we know, it has to transform. It has to adapt. And you know, when we look back in 10 or 20 years and we look back at today, we think, well, that was the beginning. And that was a time when it started uh, down its path of more digital engagement. Um, the blend may be in place at the moment, just the same as it is in academia, but the future is definitely leaning heavily towards a digital environment. Thank you. That also brings us very nicely to the to the suggestion by Sean. Why not uh, engage in aspects of gaming to um, develop foreign policy options and, and possible paths? And um, there were lots of questions in the comments here on Zoom, also on Facebook and uh, YouTube. So I'm actually turning again to my colleague um, Natasha for a summary again. What has been happening there? Over to you, Natasha. Uh, thank you, Kat. Uh, like earlier on, we had a comment once again from Fabrice who uh, commented on two changes that digitalization has brought about. Uh, the first one he mentioned pertains to the time dimension where basically actors have the opportunity to engage with each other at any time. And this can happen outside of summits or conferences. He also touched upon the question of inclusiveness, uh, given that um, we are seeing the involvement of some actors that we do not usually see uh, participate in the deliberation. Um, we had a discussion actually in the chat whether um, online platforms uh, give way to more inclusion or not. And this is um, something that will be further discussed uh, actually um, later on uh, this week. Uh, I'm sure you will uh, mention this later on. Um, there was also a point raised by uh, Tanya Mikha Mikhailova who asked about um, uh, who acknowledged that diplomacy uh, has the ability to adapt. But in the COVID-19 uh, crisis, we have seen uh, many conflicts, uh, conflicts escalate. And uh, she uh, wondered if this is precisely the lack of direct communication among diplomats or among politicians. This would be all from the chat for now. Thank you so much. Um, since time is, is not on our side and we only have um, 10 minutes left, I would like to again turn to our speakers, but this time perhaps for um, reflections on, on those further comments and questions, but also um, some final reflections or kind of aspirations for the future from your perspective as observers or um, practitioners. And again, I would suggest going in the same order. So Dahlia, would you start us off with some further responses and final reflections? Thank you, Katarina. Well, um, uh, I think that these are fascinating times to be a diplomat, but most importantly, to study diplomacy. I agree with Sean. We cannot go on inventing new terms for diplomacy. There is only diplomacy that is conducted in many settings, in many ways, and has been doing it for centuries. And I think it's now the time not to adapt to a new reality, but it's actually about changing. So diplomacy doesn't have to adapt to digital, um, to digital platforms or digital environments that are already there for users or consumers. Diplomats have to change the way, but also, ojo, we have to change co-evolving with technology. This co-evolution means that we also need the development of, of tools that allow us to perform our work. Our work is not to write reports only. Our work is to create confidence and trust. Our work is to interpret, be the, the, the translators of the information and to generate value out of our own sources. And we have to, to be able to protect our sources. So in that way, the diplomatic profession is a mixture of more or less uh, 
other professions. We've been working on this in, in the project of innovation and diplomacy here at the embassy. And we have been reflecting on, for instance, how journalism consultants and brokers work in a way as a diplomat would do. So we incorporate many skills of other professions. And what we have to do, I think the challenge for our profession nowadays is to better understand its role, how and when it produces public value. And of course, how do we do that now in a situation in which we have an increasing uh, digitalized environment? But this is not about adaptation, and I want to, to underline that. It's about change. Thank you. Uh, an excellent point also about um, co-evolution instead of separating into, into various um, diplomacies. Um, Christine, any, any further reflections and perhaps also um, final comments for the session from you? Yes, thank you. I mean, it's not very uh, diplomatic uh, to open up a new Pandora's box in a uh, final reflective comment, but I want to pick on one thing that was um, coming up in the in the questions, which is this idea, does digitalization actually make it possible for more actors to get access to the world of diplomacy? And this is something uh, that, at least in the field that I've been studying, is often linked to questions of social media. Uh, is kind of another aspect of how digitalization en enters the field of diplomacy. And that we, what we see here is kind of this assumption that, yeah, but once ambassadors, for example, start tweeting what they think, uh, then the public can be more engaged in diplomatic decision making. And then this kind of secret diplomatic backroom where all these secret negotiations happen becomes obsolete. Now, this is kind of the technological fantasy story told in some of the parts of academic literature. This is completely not what we see when we look at the field of practice, where there's actually a lot of re reluctance against uh, taking on these kinds of digital communication methods, primarily uh, kind of centered on concerns of confidentiality, uh, trust, tact, a lot of the things we've already talked about, but also the fear that once this kind of like um, confidential secret diplomatic room gets um, penetrated, traded or uh, kind of uh, infiltrated by diplomatic, uh, sorry, by digital communication technologies, that something very important is lost in diplomacy. But I think what I just want to want to say um, as the last point is really that I think we should uh, kind of stay away from these easy arguments, diplomacy is changing this way and this way, and also kind of stay away from these problematic simplifying dichotomies between the online and the offline or digital and analog, because they simply don't uh, seem to apply to, to this world. Thank you. I think it's an extremely crucial reminder to say that digitization and digital diplomacy does not automatically lead to more transparency or more inclusion of actors such as non-state actors that are not normally at the table. I think it's a very important reminder and pushback against the early days of uh, digital diplomacy and some of the aspirations and hopes associated with that. Not that we shouldn't aspire to it, but I think it's not, it's not an automatic, it's not a given. That's a very important uh, point to keep in mind. Um, Sean, from your perspective, any uh, final reflections, final points uh, we should put on our list of things to think about and things to do? I'd like to stress that last point. Um, the important stuff in diplomacy, international relations is done behind closed doors. And I suspect it always will be done behind closed doors because doing it in public makes it harder to achieve agreements, particularly in conflict situations. And I prefer peace and stability to openness and democracy any day, but that might just be my background as a diplomat. Um, I'd also like to agree with Dahlia. This is not about di adapting diplomacy to the technology we should be changing the technology. Um, diplomats have been very guilty of using off-the-shelf technologies which were designed, for example, like Facebook, to make Mark Zuckerberg rich, not to help diplomacy. As a consequence, we've gone down some very bad paths and re reduced our efficiency and our ability to do with disinformation. The big challenge for diplomats now is to work together with technology, technologists, to drive the technology in the directions that we want it to go. And so start designing tailor-made products that actually serve diplomacy, not where diplomacy is having to use readily adapted stuff. And I think if we do that, there is a tremendous scope for reinforcing our diplomatic capabilities. We've not looked at online platforms for scenario building in conflict zones or in conflict resolution. We've not looked at simulation exercises. 
We've not explored new ways of doing policy making. All of these areas offer enormous benefits. And if actually I would like to go right back to the beginning and say actually where we've seen most digital innovation in diplomacy has been in consular work, not in public diplomacy, nor in political work. So we should all of us go and talk to our heads of consular section like Dahlia and learn from them. Thank you. And, and again, I find myself also in, in, in agreement with this point that the tools need to adapt to the practice of diplomacy and, and not uh, vice versa. Um, Jeffrey, any last reflections from you? Any responses to what we heard so far? Yeah, well, um, I'm just going to lob a hand grenade out there. And there's an elephant in the room that nobody has mentioned yet whatsoever. And I'm surprised because most conferences mention it to begin you know, at least once or twice. And that is China. We know that China's preferences for diplomatic processes are going to become more and more influential with time. Uh, historically, the UK, France, the United States, when their economic and political power increases, their influence over diplomatic processes also increases. China is going to do this sooner or later. So we should also be looking at China's preferences for the blend of digital versus in-person diplomacy and looking at China to see how it sees the future of diplomatic processes. I think this is where uh, individual diplomats, embassies and foreign ministries should be looking towards. Thank you so much. That's a really important reminder to look at very specific practices of very specific actors and, and what's happening there. Basically, all that's left for me to do is to issue many, many thank yous, uh, most of all to our excellent speakers who uh, engaged in a lively debate. And there were so many points that I found extremely interesting that I noted down, points that we will come back to in the discussion, but also points that kind of take us in, in the right direction for future reflections and um, better practice in the future. So to our speakers, thank you so much for, for joining us and for taking the time in, in a very busy schedule this autumn. But also thank you to our audience. We had um, 60 people here in Zoom and 30 people on Facebook and YouTube, which is a, a tremendous outcome. I'm very happy. And also for you, thank you for taking the time for submitting your comments and questions. As always, we will follow up with a written summary of this debate that will also respond to some of the comments and questions we couldn't bring into the debate today and um, the recording of this debate. The last couple of minutes, I would also like uh, to use to make you aware of a couple of upcoming events. Um, so first of all, on the 8th of October, this is um, this Thursday, we will meet to kind of look at the uh, UN General Assembly debates um, that happened um, at the high level segments. Um, our researchers at Diplo went uh, on a deep dive into the policy priorities, priorities, the discussion framing, and the overall rhetoric that we saw um, at the uh, high level opening um, segment. And you can join us on Thursday at 1 p.m. UTC. And you can find more information at diplomacy.edu slash calendar. And I will also provide the link here in the chat. The second event that I would like to uh, recommend very warmly is on the 22nd of October. That's Thursday in two weeks, and it's on the future of multilateral diplomacy. And that's a hybrid conference in which we actually pick up lots of the comments and lots of the questions and points for debate that we discussed today, but we'll be able to deepen them a bit more in the discussion. And some of the speakers we had today will also again join us for that conference. So you're very warmly invited to join us in um, two weeks as well. And again, I put the link for that event in the chat. So with all these uh, reminders and uh, things about upcoming events and upcoming debates, again, thank you so much to our speakers and thank you to our audience. It's been a pleasure to moderate this debate. Thank you.